Okay. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening or whatever it happens to be where you are. Uh, we're just going to give a moment before we start for a few last folks to join us and then we'll begin. Perfect. So I think people will probably continue to join us over the next minute or two, but uh, just being aware of uh, everyone having so much work to do, <laughs> I'm going to keep us on time, hopefully, and then we'll leave some, some room for question and answer at the end of the session. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I am working on the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam peoples here on the west coast of Canada. Um, and this is our, I think, third developer uh, webinar where we do a quarterly update on um, the work that we've been doing to give the folks in the community a sense of what, what's uh, working between releases, uh, that often releases take a year and a half uh, to come out and folks need some way of knowing what we're working on and also to um, kind of gain interest on some of the shared concerns that we've all got. Things like metadata, multilingual support, um, upgrades, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, without further ado, uh, my name is Alex Smetcher. And I am the Associate Director of Development. And am I missing a font or is that actually blank? That's a good start. There we go, introductions. Um, I have with me here a number of folks from PKP who will also introduce themselves. Um, and we have a number of folks, uh, names I recognize on the list here. So welcome, some folks I don't yet. So uh, if this is your first webinar, then, then welcome to you as well. Um, I wanna give first a very high level view of the roadmap. And again, this is just because we, we're trying to have these sessions quarterly and it's a good opportunity for us to let everyone know what the work in progress is and to give a high level view of what the software roadmap is. So um, where are we? Uh, in brief, um, this is a summary of the different kind of branches of the software. And anything older than 3.2, this is OGS, OMP and OPS is no longer maintained. And as we've been doing for the last year or more, we do encourage everyone to upgrade. Um, the current, um, uh, LTS release, that's long-term support, is 3.3.0. That's been out for a couple of years now, um, almost three years, basically. It's been very stable, very reliable. And uh, what we're seeing is we're seeing the community consolidate onto that release, um, which means that we spend less time amongst the team uh, answering questions about older, older bugs that have already been fixed a long time ago on the forum. Um, it just becomes a lot easier for us to maintain that community. And if you're using an older release than that, it is going to be uh, out of date and buggy. You're going to have trouble with um, integrations like ORCID and Crossref increasingly. So for all those reasons, uh, if you haven't yet upgraded, please do. For those of you who are on 3.3 uh, or even 3.4, which came out uh, a few months back, we released branches, the actively maintained branches. And uh, as you see, one of these is LTS. 3.3 is LTS, which means that we're committing to maintaining it for a longer term of time. That's uh, three to five years whereas the 3.4.0 is not LTS, and we're only committed to maintaining that for probably a couple of years. The idea here is that we have two different tracks for upgrades. Um, if you are uh, limited in your IT resources, as many different groups are, um, we want to offer you the LTS approach, which says, I don't want to mess with it too often. I need it to be reliable, and I don't necessarily need any cutting edge features. Um, and then for those of you who do have the IT resources, Maybe you're working on developing things yourself um, uh, or maybe need uh, one of the cutting edge features. Then there's the non-LTS track, which uh, updates more frequently and um, does require a bit more care and feeding, but it's also available. And essentially, uh, you can pursue either of these upgrade tracks as you like. So you can either upgrade from 3.3 to 3.4 to 3.5, or if you're doing the more conservative approach, you can go right from 3.3 to 3.5. Um, what the dev team is currently working on is the 3.5 release here. And we started working on this basically as soon as we kicked 3.4 out the door. Um, and we're expecting that it'll be released hopefully in the fourth quarter of next year. Um, of course, as that comes closer, we'll firm up our release plans. And that will be our next LTS. So uh, those of you who are using 3.3 LTS, that'll be a smooth upgrade path. And it will be a, a release that we'll commit to maintaining for another three to five years. So watch out for that one. Um, 
we have talked internally about our release plans and uh, essentially we had talked kind of informally about releasing a major release every year. Um, the release process just by itself takes at least a full quarter. And so of course, doing this every year with just a full quarter eaten up by the release process just wasn't reasonable. So we most recent, more, more recently agreed that we were going to relax our timelines for releases to about every year and a half. In practice, this is actually what we've been doing, but um, yeah, it's a more realistic approach than, than once every year. So you can expect on average, we're gonna shoot for this 1.5 years between major releases, and we're gonna alternate between LTS and non-LTS releases. So an LTS release uh, should succeed the last one every kind of three-ish years, more or less. So uh, zooming into this 3.5 release here and talking about major features, we'll see a little bit of this in a minute, um, but uh, this is the short list and I'll, I'll show you the roadmap in a second. But essentially the major, major feature here is submission lists. Um, this is the editorial uh, interface that's most used by editors. It pre presents information about all the work in progress. Um, and with, our, our, with help from our good friends at Cielo, uh, they've been able to really help us with resourcing this, designing it, then we've, turned around that design work with Devika, who we'll be talking in a minute, and had her do a lot of outreach to different groups to make sure that we get this design right. And that'll be a huge part of that 3.5.0 release. There's a number of other really big pieces here. Um, ORCID, credit, Roar integration. We're going from doing these as plugins to having them integrated into the application. And that gives us a lot better control over how it looks, how it works, and then building some of those workflows more into the core of the system so that they're um, you know, deeper integrations that are a little bit less lumpy when a user runs into them. Um, the last couple of things I'll mention, the big one that I'll talk about in a second, and then a home for JAX documents. And this is uh, part of our XML roadmap. We hope to have some news on the XML roadmap in the next uh, few months. So please stay tuned for that. I know it's been frustrating to a lot of folks that we haven't had much to say about it since the uh, Libero editor kind of got to end of life before we expected it to, um, but we hope to have some more on that soon. Uh, I will talk just briefly about a couple of things here. One is that the roadmap has moved to GitHub. We used to use a uh, Google spreadsheet for our roadmap, but now we've moved it to GitHub. So here's the same old link that we had before, but now it directs to this uh, roadmap. Um, I believe I've walked through this last time as well. Um, in short, there's a tab at the top here for each of the um, different releases. So if you wanna know what's coming in 3.5, Click on this tab at the top, and then you can scroll through the categories and look at the items here. Um, what we're hoping to do is to build out um, next a bit of a timeline here that'll show the work in progress and the dates. This is all pretty blank because we don't tend to fill out dates on our issues yet, but once we start doing that, you'll see that fill out. If you're curious about any one of these items, you can of course click through to the issue. Uh, submission tracking uh, is probably the best example. Here you'll see just a lot of discussion, some design work. And if you're curious about this work and, and how it's gonna impact your work, please do take a look. Uh, we're gonna try to make sure that the, um, the top of this, I mean, it, these all devolve into very technical discussions uh, by the time we get into coding. But at the top, uh, we try to keep it fairly general so that uh, if you're an editor who's curious about functionality and maybe you're terrified of GitHub, it is, will still allow you to get some information here that's useful to you. Um, Okay, perfect. Uh, a couple of words on documentation. And uh, this is just, I don't know why there's a SQL query here, but okay. Uh, <laughs> um, a word on, on documentation for hooks. If you're writing uh, plugins for uh, our software, one of the frequent um, complaints is that you have to kind of know where to look in the code for, for hooks. Um, so we've just added a couple of small things here that are not fully launched yet, but will be coming very soon. One is that uh, we've added some tools to capture hook self-documentation in the function headers. And so if you're uh, looking at a function, um, you'll see that these hooks are now summarized at the top. And this is maintained automatically, although uh, you can manually add descriptions and stuff here. Um, the point of this is that if you look at the self-documentation that's generated through uh, previously Doxygen, now PHP Documenter, you'll see the hook listed in the self-documentation that you can then browse through the website. But more importantly, there's now a comprehensive list of hooks in the system that, uh, that is collected from that self-documentation. Um, this is still a work in progress. You can't click through any of these yet, so it's limited use, but um, as we get a bit of a chance to knit this together and as the uh, PHP documentary feature we're using for this gets a bit better refined, this will become an easy way to discover uh, hooks and find out what parameters are given to them. we look at descriptions and so on. So you'll no longer be quite as dependent on reading the code to find out what the hooks are. 
Uh, okay, a few words about invitations. Um, so there was a feature in OJS previous releases, OPS and ONP as well, which was called access keys. And this was intended as a general purpose kind of magic link feature where you could send a user a link, they could click it, and then it would um, include a, a, an access key that would bypass the, uh, the login process for them. That was used for one-click reviewer access. So if you had a setup that uh, turned on that feature, then reviewers would receive in their invitations to review a link with a, an access key on the end of it that would skip through the login process because reviewers typically don't remember their, their login credentials. Um, so it would skip that process for them and you'd get less uh, dropped reviews because they, they couldn't log in. It was also used for email validation. So when a user created an account, um, there's an optional setting that, that forces them to uh, receive an email and then click a link to validate the account. And that was also using this access key feature. That's been deprecated, and now we're introducing uh, a broader feature called invitations, which does the same uh, has the same capabilities, but also does more. It's a generic kind of invite someone to do something uh, tool set. Um, it will also be used in addition to the previous use cases. It'll be used for a lot of relevant to um, some GDPR improvements that we're doing through uh, the CraftAway project with our friends at the Finnish Federation of Learning Societies, and of course, TIB in Germany. And many, many thanks to them for their participation here. Um, so things like uh, one of the major complaints uh, with our GDPR um, compliance or lack of compliance is around inviting a reviewer to participate in a review. Right now, um, when you invite a reviewer, you may create an account for them, uh, and you certainly uh, add an invitation to, for them to review. They may have an account, but not a reviewer role, et cetera, et cetera. Anywhere where we're currently undertaking an action on a, on a user's behalf, we are trying to shift it from undertaking the action directly, so creating an account for a reviewer, to instead um, inviting them to uh, undertake the action on their own. Um, I mentioned before that reviewers often don't know their login credentials. Well, one of the reasons for that is that our, um, our approach to uh, to creating user accounts is that the editor creates a user account for the reviewer and enters, in fact, their email, their name, their username, all that stuff on their behalf without them actually having any uh, any say in the matter. What that often means is that the reviewer's usernames are not something the reviewer would ever choose. So there's all these knock-on effects from this choice to allow editors to do things on behalf of users without the user um, having a chance to intervene and do it themselves. So in the future, all of these processes is inviting reviewers, adding roles, adding user accounts, will much more rely on a uh, invitation process where the editor might pre-fill a form and then send the invitation, but it's up to the user to receive the invitation email to um, confirm the information that's been entered for them on their behalf, and then to actually press the button to perform the action, to create a user, to assign a review, all that sort of thing. So we've done some infrastructural work to support this general toolkit and here's an example of using it. It's very simple to use. If you're a developer working with the software, um, essentially you'll have to create a class to represent the invite, and then you simply attach an email to it that's typically when you're sending an email that will contain the invitation, then you dispatch it. And the class called reviewer access invite, this is one that uh, grants uh, reviewer access to a submission, um, is very simple as well. You've got just a few classes, a uh, few functions that extend the base invitation class. Um, this one here adds variables to the email. If you have any additional like names or something that you want to add to your email template, um, you want to execute some pre-dispatch actions. What this does is make sure that you have a chance for the invitation toolkit to remove any previous invitations that might conflict. Uh, just to give a quick example, if the editor wants to invite a user to add a role to their account, let's say that they send an invitation, but they make a mistake. And then they realize, oh, I actually added the wrong role there. They want to then send a second invitation. Well, the user in the meantime is gonna receive these two emails that uh, say, do you wanna add this role? We wanna make sure that if they click the first one, the wrong one, they're not allowed to undertake that action. In fact, they're given a message saying, this is no longer valid. So when they receive the second invitation that's replacing the first one, uh, it'll be handled correctly. Uh, so this will give the code a chance to remove previous invites of the same sort. And then the most important action here is the accept handle invitation. And this is the function that, that gets called when the user clicks the accept action um, function. And this allows for um, data to be unpacked from the invitation. We might suggest names, we might suggest usernames, email addresses for new accounts, but this is where it gets unpacked into the form and allows the uh, user to say, yes, this is who I am and I authorize this action. So we'll be using that a lot in the future. And you'll hear a lot of uh, discussion of this feature if you are interested in 
user registration, GDPR, reviewer invitations, any number of other things. We'll be referring to this quite a bit. And thanks to Dimitris for his work on this. Uh, okay, I'm going to pass it over to Vitaly to talk about submission lists. And Vitaly, are you okay for me to run the slides or would you like to share your own screen? Yeah, uh, you can run, uh, run the slides. Great, yeah. So, uh, moving to the first slide, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, backend parts for submission lists uh, is uh, building REST API endpoints and extending existing entities to support retrieving data that we need for the, for the dashboard. Uh, so the biggest part, part there is already done. Uh, now it's possible to retrieve so, uh, submissions in the review stage with various filters, like for example, uh, retrieve only submissions uh, awaiting reviewers to be assigned. Uh, and the system now, uh, now has a, a setting uh, to pick a number of reviewers that should be assigned to each submission. Uh, also, uh, there is a separate endpoint to re uh, retrieve counts of submissions in the list. Uh, get review. And, uh, also, the endpoints are working depending on a user role. So we have uh, separate dashboards for editors, sub-editors, assistants, authors. For example, manager uh, has access to all submissions, yeah, as it was before. Uh, but editor for those where uh, he or she is assigned. For reviewers, it's slightly different. Reviewers will uh, see a list of review assignments on them. And there will be an opportunity if the user has a double role, let's say review and uh, an author, to uh, pick the dashboard if he wants. Uh, that required ext uh, extending existing submission collector. Uh, and a, a collector is a class that is used to build SQL queries. There was some work needed to be done to retrieve aggregated uh, data on uh, uh, regarding reviews. And probably that was the, the hardest one uh, in this work. Uh, so next slide, please. So API points uh, and extending uh, submission collector was refactoring review assignments. And now it uses the same pattern as our other entities, like let's say submissions, uh, publications, or emails. And uh, here's two examples how uh, assignment can be retrieved. And another one, how review assignments can be filtered using the echo lecture. So here, yeah, uh, yeah see, uh, this work was done uh, to uh, to be able to build endpoints for review assignments for a reviewer. And that's all from my side. And uh, Yarda will show uh, submission in, in, in action, what we have so far. Hi everyone. Um, so uh, I'm Erda, uh, joining from Czech Republic. I am still a relatively recent uh, joiner to the team. I joined six months ago. And um, one of my main responsibilities is to uh, implement the new UIs that um, Devika designed. Um, and currently, uh, one of the biggest features I'm working on is the submission list. And pretty much leveraging what uh, Vitaly described, uh, because lots of, is, lots of it is happening on the server side. The PHP is still deciding lots of things. And my, <clears throat> my task is just to present it to the user uh, in the user interface. So this is still obviously lots of work in progress, uh, but I will share a screen and give you like sneak peek how things are uh, coming together.
So this is uh, what you are seeing is the old good uh, submission list you are all familiar with. And we hidden this interface, the, the new submission listing behind the feature flag. So we have opportunity to actually uh, evolve it over time during the development cycle. So now I do just the trick to enable that uh, feature, reload the page, and I'm getting, you know, the uh, new visuals and new functionality. So one of the things that uh, Vitaly mentioned was the tricky part, for example, to calculate the counts for every view, uh, because every view gives you different list of the submissions and it's very useful to know the count. And he, here on the interface, it's simple number, but the hard work was to actually uh, run these SQL queries in efficient way to be able to uh, show them. And also some of the filtering functionality are uh, already implemented. So first thing we can look at that the switching between the views um, are working. So uh, every time I change uh, the view, I again use uh, Vitalis endpoint and that gives me the accurate uh, list of the submissions. And uh, we can uh, look at some of the filtering. So currently I am logging as a journal uh, manager. So I can see pretty much all submissions uh, from the journal and I might be interested to uh, filter that by the, by the editor. So here I can, uh, I have autocomplete. Again, it's using another endpoint to give me the list of the matching um, editors. Uh, I can select one, apply, and now I have slightly reduced list. So now it's only uh, 19 submission. Um, I, another thing I can do, I can uh, search for a submission by searching for, for a string. So for example, I can search for this string and it gives me um, submission submissions that, you know, uh, that are matching that. Uh, one of the things that I worked uh, on and I believe will be very useful is that uh, all these states, as they are changing in the UI, they are also reflected in the query parameters in the URL. And the good benefit of that, that any of these filters, um, you find exactly what you need and then you can easily bookmark it. So um, what, what could go wrong? We can try it. So if I just uh, copy paste this URL, and try to open it, it still uh, remembers all the filters. It remembers which uh, view I, I selected. So I can easily bookmark, you know, multiple of these uh, uh, selections. And this should, you know, help with the uh, workflow being able to faster to find what, to, what, what you um. In terms of the UI, recently I worked on the UI for uh, showing details for the uh, editorial activity, but that's currently only UI. We don't have the live data there yet. And you know, one of the one of the main kind of focus when Devika was wor working on it is basically just to be able to as much as possible fro from from uh, this screen. So. Um, we will have lots more on, on this screen uh, to come. Um, but this basically give me lots of the uh, details about the submissions. And uh, we have the cases when we uh, need to present, you know, multiple of these uh, screens on top of each other. So we can see example of that. If you, for example, on this submission, you would decide to assign editors. Uh, this would uh, give you the alt uh, screen for assign editors. We keep that functionality from uh, from our previous tech, but the challenge was to in accessible way to actually present uh, site uh, site uh, models. So in this case, we can see that it's coming from this uh, secondary uh, site model successfully, um, and we can also. If if the submission is in the state when we want to assign editor, we can also do it directly from the main screen, and it's uh, uh, coming with the same screen, ju but just with uh, uh, with one model. And uh, also, just to illustrate, 
illustrate uh, one more thing that Vitaly mentioned is that it uh, depends on how you look. So if we log in as the author, it's uh, reflected in lots of these things. So so the number of views you can see is, is limited only for the ones that are useful for authors. Also, if you look at the filters, now we can't filter, you know, for a, uh, you know, uh, by, by, by editor because that also wouldn't be relevant for an author. So all these different variances are configured on, on, on the um, backend side in, in PHP. Um, okay, so that's, that's the sneak peek. Uh, we will obviously have more to show in, in future, but that's uh, for today. And, you're, and if you wanted to go ahead and move on to translations and view, I think that's you as well. I can share a screen if you like, or you can do it yourself. Uh, yeah, if you can, I can uh, share the presentation. So um, one of the things that uh, was not as great for developer experience was using the translation in our Vue.js talk. So as you may uh, know, on building the admin in interfaces, we currently mix and match the Smarty templates with the Vue.js components. There are good reasons to, to do it, but that's not a um, topic for uh, what I want to illustrate. The, what was what was challenging uh, in in this scenario is that the smarty templates, since they are server side rendered, they have access to all the PHP functionality, including the translations. So on the left side, you can see the example of how the translation works in the smarty, where you call the, this translate uh, function, and the PHP will you know handle it and provide the translation during the server side rendering. Um, but since we are using more and more Vue.js, uh, which are doing the rendering on the uh, client side in the browser, uh, translations um, there as well, be able to basically achieve the same thing in the in the Smarty. But since we don't have that translation at, at hand from, from the PHP, we had to look at the mechanism how to actually uh, achieve it. Uh, so far, we were using some of the I would say maybe workarounds uh, where we were like explicitly passing the needed translation to the Vue.js components uh, as, as 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 a data, and then we were kind of passing them down to the components they actually need them, and that required lots of manual uh, work, you know, to actually get the right translation to the right place, and also make sure that we are providing all the translations and not more that than is actually needed. Um, so uh, the, this this is the uh, problem I uh, was uh, looking at, and the mechanism uh, that uh, that basically let you use the translation exactly the same way as you currently do in in the Smarty. So you basically, as you see on the right screen, um, you know I'm referencing you know the translation in in the Vue.js, and the goal was, was that this is only what you have to do, and then. Uh, the process will care of that that translation actually will be available in the in the browser. So if you go to the next slide, uh, here is basically technical description how it's how it's working. So uh, as as a developer, when I'm working on the user interfaces, uh, we are using uh, build tool. Some of you may know like Webpack, for example, uh, in our project when we migrated to the view free, we started using white. And uh, this is basically responsible to create, to bundle all the components and all the uh, front-end logic together and make it ready for uh, browser use. And the better fit of that is that, you know, since it's consuming all these Vue.js component, um, I was able to create plugin, which basically intercept all these translation uses using uh, like uh, re regular expression. So it detects all, all these uh, in the components that are actually used and it generates this JSON file. Uh, so seamlessly as, as you are building your front end, it generates this, uh, this file. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to change it. 
uh, manually. And then uh, this file from the uh, developer uh, process is available for uh, uh, PHP, uh, which then is used in, in the runtime. So if, if you look at on the right side, uh, how that runtime workflow works, uh, there is new endpoint, which is delivering uh, the actual translations for a given language. And because it already knows what the local skis are needed, it basically just takes all these lo local skis, uh, retrieves the translations, um, you know, from the from the database, and sends this um, JavaScript object to the browser. And since it's built as a separate endpoint, which is retrieved like in parallel from all other resources, including the CSS and images, it's it's pretty efficient and. Um, the cached by a browser. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that basically makes this whole process seamless. If you would be interested in more details, there is there is link to the um, GitHub issue, and this is already working well in on the main branch uh, for the three point five release. Um, that's uh, all from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sierra, and I think Bojana, you're next. Am I okay to keep sharing the screen here? Uh, yes, please. Yes, I would like to mention a few metadata improvements that have been done by the project uh, Craft Away so far. Uh, some of them are very close to be merged and some uh, still need some refinement. On the next slide, we see uh, one big change is the separation of the submission and metadata languages from the journal website languages. Uh, on the website settings, there will be uh, submission languages settings, similar to website set, uh, language settings. And um, there you can add or remove languages for the submissions, define default submission language, um, select all languages a submission can be um, uh, accepted in, and if, uh, select all uh, languages for the metadata uh, that metadata can be provided in. This all allows submissions to be in languages different than a uh, journal website. Also metadata to be in languages that are different as submission language. Um, this way you can, for example, have journal website content in English and French and have submission accepted in English, French, and Spanish, and have metadata provided additional in German, for example. Uh, for submissions, all languages are available, not only the OGES uh, languages that, or the languages the OGES is translated in. Uh, currently, we use um, the language list from ISO standard 6. 39-3, but together with uh, language dialects from uh, we have in OGES. But, but I think we still need to see if this is the right uh, source or if there is something else we can bet use uh, to better support dialects. Um, because the submission language can be now uh, added and removed, uh, uh, for example, we need to um, uh, to uh, consider existing submission languages when, when viewing and editing a submission. Um, yes, I think that would be it. <laughs> On the next slide, you just see the um, summary of that all and the GitHub uh, issue uh, where you can find uh, some more information. And on the next slide, there are a few more um, uh, topics uh, and work in progress. For example, um, the, met the Dublin Core Metadata Field Languages will be removed. It was originally meant uh, for the editors to enter all the languages a submission exists in, but it is rarely and uh, slightly different used by the users and by the ser uh, services we support. 
So we're using Nidit in that way. Now the Galley languages can be considered instead. Then um, a possibility to display metadata in multiple languages on the same article landing page is provided. Uh, the general managers uh, for the default general team. Uh, general managers and editors can select what uh, metadata they would like to have in displayed in separate or in multiple languages, for example, title and subtitle, abstract or keywords. And in that in then those would be displayed in all existing languages. And one more big task is to pro uh, give possibility to see and change the publication language after the submission. Um, here is also here are also the GitHub uh, issues links that, where you can find more information. And uh, Craft OA project is planning to work on a few more improvements. Uh, 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 so big thanks to the Craft OA team. Uh, Yes, I think I, that's it for me. Thanks, Morjana. And Devika, I think you're up next, and I'm happy to keep clicking through if that's okay with you. Yes, that is. Hi, everybody. Um, so before I start talking about accessibility, I want to give a really helping us oh. through and like uh, this and spearheading our, um, you know, efforts when it comes to accessibility. So uh, today, um, I'm just gonna talk about what um, accessibility is in general, and then I'll go on talking about um, the process which we um, are trying to follow for our softwares going forward. So Alec, if you could go on the next slide. Yeah, so what is web accessibility? Like, I know there's like a lot of information information out there but I think it's very important for all of us to be um, continuously informed so that you know we keep making efforts about it so it's nothing but um, website like web accessibility means that the website's tools or technologies that are designed and developed for people with special abilities can use them right and more specifically our users can perceive understand navigate and interact the web without any difficulty they can contribute to uh, the web accessibility um, in different ways including like auditory cognitive neurological physical speech and visual forms um, web accessibility also benefits people without any uh, disabilities, for example, you know, while using your mobile phone, smart, smart watches, smart TVs or any other devices with small screens and input modes, right? Along with older people with changing abilities due to aging or like, you know, different kinds of technologies when they come in place, even all of us find it sometimes difficult uh, to use them on a daily basis, which is why it becomes very important to implement accessibility in different um, forms. Um, it also helps people with temporary uh, disabilities, such as a broken arm or lost classes, and people with situational limitations, such as bright sunlight or in an environment where they cannot listen to audio. Um, say, if you're working in public spaces, or um, in a college where there's so much noise that you know you're not able to listen to anything and it also helps people with slow internet connection or who have limited expensive bandwidth right so which is why accessibility uh, becomes very 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 important like if you can go on to the next slide so there are some guidelines that we've been using to check accessibilities and they belong to the uh, WCAG 2.2, which has 13 guidelines, um, and they are organized under principles of perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And um, each of these guidelines, there are testable success criteria, and they go from three levels, which is A, AA, and AAA. So let me walk you through these because this is how we are also categorizing our efforts into accessibility. 
So consider the least strict, which is level A success criteria is essential for every website. So if your website doesn't conform with these guidelines, it may have serious accessibility issues that prevent users from disabilities from using it, right? So for example, of this criteria includes non-text content on images and videos that must have a text. Um, users must be able to access content using a keyboard only and forms must include labels or instructions so users know what's expected of them. Um, uh, assistive technologies such, uh, such as screen readers must be able to access this content and information or instructions must be conveyed through shape, size and color alone, right? Now, moving on to the next level, while level A allows organizations to cover basics, uh, the, le uh, the double A goes further towards for users in a wider variety of context. It is for this reason that most accessibility experts recommend this performance level. And as a reminder, um, at this uh, conformance level, the web page and content would satisfy all levels of level A and double A. So when you go on to satisfy double A, you'll be also ticking all the criteria of level A. So some of the examples of a double A include that text and background must use good color contrast. Um, for example, um, have a minimum level of contrast of at least 4.5 to 1. Uh, the content should be organized under clear headings using a logical order. For example, there should be a heading one, a heading two, a heading three. And elements that affect navigation should be consistent throughout the website. And now I go on to the last level, which is the AAA, which is the highest per, uh, possible conformance level. And as a result, holds organizations to the highest standard of accessibility. Um, and again, once uh, you end up satisfying this level, you also end up ticking uh, level A and level AA as well. Um, though um, uh, like level AAA may not be applicable or realistic for everyone to achieve, we should strive to meet as many of these criteria as possible. And some of them are like pre-recorded video content must have sign language translation and extended audio description should be provided to pre-recorded videos, right? So this is like a basic, um, very basic knowledge on web accessibility. And Alec, if you move on to the next slide. I'll talk about the process that we are trying to follow uh, for uh, OJS. So basically, in step one, what we'll be doing is we'll be introducing new features or like revamping existing features. For example, we created the new um, submission wizard in 3.4, and I'll use that as an example of how uh, we'll go about with the accessibility process. Then in step two, we run machine tests to test for accessibility, right? So once, say, uh, this, the new submission wizard was deployed, right, in the next development cycle, what we'll do is we'll run our tests um, uh, to catch all accessibility issues um, in the feature, right? Uh, we'll then work on correcting these issues and conducting user tests. So um, I described those levels, right? Those levels will form like our uh, the way we prioritize our efforts, where we try to tick as many as single A and double A levels first so that we are meeting um, all the accessibility criteria. Um, and then go on to AAA, which are good to have. Mm -hmm. And once like we've prioritized and worked on fixing the machine run issues, we'll then go on to conduct user tests to really like bundle all the efforts that we are making and make sure that we are on the right track. And once after the user test, um, it's confirmed and like, you know, we, we are like say 75% out there is when, uh, we'll uh, deploy it in the next release cycle, right? So this is how we're aiming to follow our accessibility process. Um, and I think you'll get to see some of the efforts that we're making um, in the new submission wizard where we're trying to make it more accessible for uh, 3.5.
So yeah, that's it from my end. Thank you. I think I'll pass it on to Alec to talk a bit about the Hanover Sprint. Sure, thank you. And uh, we have a couple of Q and A's that came up already, and those have been answered. So thanks for folks for answering those. Um, please feel free. We're in our last couple of minutes here of canned content to add questions. And I know that we're bouncing back and forth between technically intense discussions and editor functionality kinds of questions. All questions are welcome, and especially on some of this stuff when we present this to the community feedback. Um, so please don't assume that just because you're lost on some of the Vue.js stuff that you don't have very good questions that are going to help us to shape this in the future. So please, yeah, through, use the Q&A feature to add some questions. We'll do our best to get through them. And if anything comes to your mind afterwards, um, please feel free to reach out to us by any means that you've got. Um, just a quick review of the recent, this was in, um, good God, was it September, I think? Yeah, we went to Hanover, a number of us, and had sprints there, hosted by Tib. Um, so thank you very much to Tib for being a very good partner to us as a development partner, as uh, part of the Craftaway project, and as just long-term friends of the project in hosting this event. Um, we did a number of different uh, topics as we do usually for the sprints and we kind of come together and uh, figure out with our skills and our interests and a very little bit of time what we can do. This is a quick look at the subjects that we tackled. There was um, stamping journal metadata and to make that more concrete, um, let's say a journal's title changes. Um, any submissions that were to the journal in its old title should still have that old title attached to them. But any submissions after the title. So we talked about approaches to stamping that metadata on journals. So when you ask for an article, sorry, on articles, when you ask for an article's metadata, you get the journal information that was accurate at the time of that submission being published, as opposed to having that kind of evolve out of control. Um, we talked about XML, and we hope uh, again to have some more uh, news on an updated PKT roadmap, but we did some experimentation with um, TEI and JATS conversions. There's uh, some style sheets that allow for the conversion between those tools, and uh, we're, we're also working with some folks um, who are using TEI, whereas our community has been more focused on JATS, so looking to broaden our support for different tools. Um, we talked about metadata, and that's a very short word that says almost nothing because there's so much uh, in that. Um, Bojana gave a preview of some of that. Um, this is a chance for us to kind of air out our um, our work in progress on Craft Away to a larger community and have some folks come in and work on that. But suffice to say, there's a lot of talk about um, vocabularies and multilingual metadata and all this sort of thing as well. Um, we talked about online first and continuous publication, and we ended up filing a GitHub issue that took a first step at adding support for that. I know we've had um, limited support for this through the forthcoming uh, plugin that uh, NTUC uh, has put together for OJS and, and used in the past, but we've never really officially had a workflow for online first, and we filed an issue that kind of starts to um, get at that. We don't have that, <clears throat> excuse me, scheduled for development work for 3.5 quite yet, but that'll be our logical next step is once we've scoped out a minimum implementation to start tackling uh, the coding of that. So watch for that, and if, um, if you have any feedback on that, uh, please share it with us. Suffice it to say, it's of increasing interest to us. And while we haven't had a, a, a workflow coded for that yet, um, it's definitely of interest to us to do so soon. Um, documentation work, we made a lot of small improvements in a little group, and it's a great example of the kind of work that folks can do at a sprint to help us remember what the perspective is from somebody coming into it from outside of the project. I've been working with the software for way too many what the gaps are in communication and knowledge. And a, a sprint group can really help to tackle those in a really useful way very quickly. And then we had a section on uh, uh, Docker and containers. Um, a number of folks there were using those in production and uh, have a lot more knowledge than I do about it. And uh, that is going to be the future for deployment, I think, for the web in general. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of work on that within uh, the PKT community as well. Um, again, huge thanks to Tib for hosting. And watch for sprint reports to come out on that. They'll have more detail about the exact changes, but um, those are the subjects. Um, the last thing I want to say, we've been doing a bit of work within the dev team, but also uh, recently in the technical committee on development environment, and uh, Yarda mentioned developer experience as well. Um, it's typically a thing that we've not had uh, overt conversations about, you know, what should be your developer environment, what are the pain points for developers working on the software that we've just kind of forgotten to work on over time. We're trying to be a bit more intentional about improving that experience. So we're talking within the team about IDEs, debugger use, optimization, 
Um, upgrades are a big subject that came up recently at the tech committee that we're hoping to put together a bit of a webinar on. Um, so uh, there is a, a little section of our PKP YouTube channel where we're collecting these. Um, feel free to explore those. And if you have any particular pain points or questions, if you're working on getting into OGS development and you find that something's missing, it'd be a wonderful chance for us to improve our documentation to maybe run a quick session, that sort of thing. So um, feel free to suggest, uh, but do watch for more of those to pop up on the YouTube channel. 10 minutes of content, very brief, hopefully very informative and pretty informal. Um, I believe that's all we have for the session. So now we're on to Q&A and uh, I'd invite anybody to take a minute to throw a question in. Um, I'll just review the two questions that already came up and uh, they've already been answered, but one was about um, whether the invitation tool set will be usable for the ORCID authorization process. Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, as part of the GDPR work, uh, we are using the invitations heavily where we previously um, allowed editors to do actions on the user's behalf. But also at the same time for 3.5, we're also integrating ORCID into the, the workflow. And that means that uh, invitation processes will have access to the ORCID toolkit not required, we're not requiring ORCID for anything, but certainly as, a, as a, uh, an option. So anywhere we're, we're rewriting this kind of invitation user creation process, we're also making sure to um, add uh, an ORCID process there. Strictly optional, but, but uh, definitely an integrated piece of it. Second question here was about uh, changes to the roadmap and whether they apply to OMP as well. I made this mistake a couple of times already talking today. Whenever I say OJS, put in brackets when you hear me and OMP and OPS. Um, we often talk about OJS and forget to mention the others, but we are releasing these applications in, in parallel. And as much as possible, when we have a feature that's going into uh, one application, it's also going into the shared library that all the applications use. And so for the most part, these features are right for one application and then they automatically come into the other applications as well. Uh, we have a simultaneous release process so that whenever, um, we release OGS, we also release OMP and OPS. So they are very much synchronized. Of course, there's concerns that won't apply to, you know, OGS because OMP does Onyx, or they won't apply to OPS because OGS and OMP do peer review, uh, that sort of thing. But for the most part, those are fine grain details and the, the applications are quite well synchronized. So a question, um, uh, Amanda mentioned that a metadata issue that came out of the Hanover Sprint was to issue a patch for 3.3 to update the Crossref schema of 3.3 to 5.3.1. Uh, Bojana, do you know that answer off the top of your head? Uh, yes, but this would need the database upgrade and this would mean the next major release that we would need to discuss internally when and how and if. <laughs> yeah, and maybe Amanda, uh, I would also want to pull in uh, Eric on our side to talk about that support because he was instrumental in the 3.4 rewrite, rewrite of the Crossref support. So if um, if you like, throw that question onto the support forum and then uh, we'll make sure that um, you know Eric gets tagged to, to give you the, the hard details on that stuff. Second question here about accessibility. Um, so the question is that the focus has been traditionally on server-side accessibility rather than on published content, um, but with the rise of AI tools, is there an interest in generating some tools to approve galley accessibility, particularly for PDFs? So this uh, actually ties into the XML strategy quite closely. Um, the question is, how do we generate galleys, your PDF, your HTML, uh, your uh, um, lens-based uh, JATS uh, documents, all that sort of thing. And um, while, while the generation of, of HTML, for example, doesn't depend on JATS, our roadmap has always been to try and kill two birds with one stone, to try to uh, facilitate conversion to JATS and then to use the JATS documents to generate PDFs and HTML and so on. And that's one of the things that we're trying to revisit a little bit because um, JATS is such a high standard um, and such a large standard that as soon as we decide we're gonna require JATS in order to do this or that or the other, um, it just becomes a very complicated thing. And we've seen a couple of high profile projects that we've aligned ourselves with, Texture and Libro Editor, come along, try to tackle JATS comprehensively. And then I think part of what's caused them to fail is that the JAT standard is so big that in order to reach a minimum standard of implementation, the software has got to be so large. And uh, there's many ways of doing you know, the same piece of metadata often in JATS. So rather than really depend on JATS as the vehicle for us to be able to generate machine readable galleys like HTML, for example, like well-structured HTML, we're looking at uh, broadening our approach to that uh, to include 
commodity HTML editors, possibly, as one of the answers here. Um, a good JATS-based editor is going to be a thing that's only usable within the publishing community that uses JATS. That's a very small community. And um, as I say, we've seen two of those projects come up and kind of fail. Um, but an HTML editor is a commodity thing. We see those in WordPress. We see them in Drupal. We see them in uh, any web-based tool you use right, right, uh, right now that allows you to enter rich content. So if we can focus on uh, the body content of the submission uh, using potentially HTML, and then look at ways to then convert that into uh, you know, your HTML, all those sorts of things, then it becomes uh, much more possible for us to um, facilitate the generation of HTML uh, in a way that's uh, then machine readable. One of the challenges that if you don't provide a good option for this toolkit, folks will continue to do what they've always done, which is edit a document in Word and then print a PDF. And uh, anybody who's tried to parse data out of PDFs knows uh, PDFs are wonderfully reproducible on the page they were designed for, but they're very variable and often very hard to use if you're trying to extract data for another use. So even just getting the text out of a PDF can be uh, like pulling teeth. So watch for more, a new emphasis on uh, ensuring intercommunication with JATS and with possibly TEI but depending less on the be all end all editor to come up to provide the centerpiece for that uh, that strategy that roadmap uh, which we've always depended on in the past and has never quite come along um, long story short once you've got good good html now you can generate bad html of course just because you've got html doesn't mean you've got accessibility but stepping out of the pdf going into commodity um, html editing that's used in the web brings us in line with you know an existing large community and set of tools that has the same needs as, as we would have to be accessible in our, our galley generation. Um, now, part of the answer, um, AI has always been part of our experimentation with creating particularly JAS documents. The idea there was that uh, a machine learning approach would be able to take uh, a Word document or plain text or something and then do a first pass at, at converting it to a semantically rich format like JATS or like semantic HTML. Um, it would be able to identify, you know, this is the abstract, here's a title, this looks like a citation, and then tease out the meaning behind those. In a citation, this part looks like the author's name, for example. Um, so we've experimented with uh, Lemonade way back in the day and open typesetting stack and or OTS uh, and Grobid much more recently. And I think we're doing some experiments right now with um, with some of the new large language model AI toolkits. Um, my concern is that anything that AI convert or, or a template-based conversion that, that you give to authors, any of these approaches will continue to be um, a necessary part of the conversion process, but you've got to be able to find problems and correct them. And so an editor is going to continue to be a big piece of it. Uh, we don't want to just trust that what comes out of an AI or an author who's self-identifying metadata is going to be correct. So anywhere you have that data being created, you have to also be able to edit it. And again, if there's a JATS model, um, that model is so big that the, the need to edit content of all forms in JATS becomes prohibitive. So stepping back, trusting OGS for metadata, including OGS as metadata editing tools, and then focusing on the full text, which has a commodity editor, is, is the strategy. I've touched on a thousand things and I'm looking at other questions here. One more question. Uh, yeah, agreed, JATS is unwieldy. Uh, yes, but it's still necessary. Um, so I don't want to presume that we're going to move away from it. JATS is still central to a lot of indexing needs, for example. But uh, I'm hoping that we can um, be interoperable with JATS without needing to tackle its complete richness all at once. Okay, uh, I think that's all the unanswered questions and we're out of time. Uh, so I want to say, of course, the team is working very hard on this stuff, a lot of work in progress, but also we mentioned a number of different partnerships and collaborations that we're working with. A uh, number of you are here as well. It means the world to us, and we wouldn't be able to do such a huge breadth of work if it wasn't for all the collaborations that are out there. So thanks to all of you. We'll be back uh, in another quarter. <laughs> so in preparation for that, Happy New Year. And um, uh, we will leave it there for now. We'll post this on YouTube. So if you have questions or things you want to ask further about, um, please follow up there and we'll watch for that and discuss it there. And of course, the support form as usual. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you in a while.